Welcome everyone, I'm John Harris and this is Security Matters. I'm happy to be here with you today and I have uh, two great panel members, Tim Sutton and Drake Jamali, and we're gonna be talking about security in the cannabis industry. And we're gonna be walking through the regulatory frameworks that are in place, the security technology that is used and how that works into um, application to the cannabis industry, and then diving into some um, best practices and, and common challenges and issues that uh, both of our guests have seen uh, in this industry uh, in their experience. So, so let's start, we're gonna jump right in um, and we'll have the guests introduce themselves briefly and then we'll jump into the regulatory side of things. So Drake, welcome to the show. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Happy to be here. And again, my name is uh, Drake Jamali. I'm manager of government relations with the Security Industry Association. And I kind of focused on our state portfolio and getting our members engaged on state issues and local issues that, that impact them. And just, uh, just a few of those issues that uh, we're kind of focusing on in the 2021 legislative cycle, school security, biometrics technology, and now cannabis security as well. Uh, so happy to be here and uh, you know have some input and have a discussion. Awesome, appreciate it. And Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I am the uh, cannabis practice leader uh, for Guidepost Solutions, a uh, security consulting and technology consulting firm. I uh, work within the cannabis industry uh, in preparing security plans for applications. Uh, technology plans, uh, security operations and management plans, and um, basically anything that uh, any cannabis organization needs in the way of security, um, we can help them. I've worked all over the country and I look forward to uh, talking about this today. Awesome, appreciate it, Tim. Well, again, thanks for being with us here, guys, and, and let's dive right in. So let's start with the regulation. And uh, you know, Tim and I, you know, we've had some conversations on uh, uh, just juxtaposing Canada and the U.S. with their regulations because Canada's got one clean federal, like black and white, and the U.S. is all over the place. It's it's uh, you know fifty different states, fifty different approaches. Uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, it's tough. It's it's challenging and it's confusing. And and Drake, you've done some research in here. C has put out some great content. Tell us about the regulations. Tell us about the frameworks that are out there, uh, and and let's uh, you know hear a little bit about what that is. Sure thing. Um, yeah. So SA, we put out a a cannabis security uh, guidelines document over the summer, just to kind of really delve in and to kind of cut through a lot of the red tape that we've seen and some of these uh, cannabis regulatory uh, bills over the past couple of years. And this guideline kind of focuses on, um, you know, the federal laws, the state laws, and kind of what are the security uh, requirements within those states that have legalized recreational use of, of cannabis and the sale of cannabis. And so just briefly uh, on the federal side, just as you mentioned earlier, you know, Canada kind of has a clean cut approach. Uh, the U.S. unfortunately uh, kind of has left it up to the states to decide at this point. And they kind of decided that over the course of the last decade. So they first had the Rohrabacher Farr Amendment in 2014. This was passed by the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives and signed into the law. It's a uh, required annual renewal, and it prohibits the, the DOJ or Department of Justice from interfering in implementation of, uh, of state medical uh, laws. And then after that, you had a 2018 Farm Bill, which legalized uh, the sale of low THC hemp nationwide and effectively took it off the, uh, the scheduled hemp derived uh, or CBD oil list. Uh, and so from that, you kind of saw this proliferation from other states who were a little worried about being, you know, kind of in the crosshairs of the Department of Justice. And so you had Colorado in 2012, that was the first state to legalize recreational use of, of marijuana. Now today, April, 2021, it's 17 states plus the District of Columbia. You had New York uh, recently, Virginia and New Mexico, which just recently legalized recreational use uh, just a week ago. So you're kind of seeing a green wave that was kind of what some people are calling it across the U.S. Again, like you mentioned, it's a 50 state quilt, uh, you know, with kind of patches and we're trying to find a thread. Uh, so we've seen that they kind of combine 
uh, three requirements. So it's on video surveillance, access control, and, and alarm systems. And that's kind of the thread that we've seen in a lot of these states uh, creating this patchwork around the US. And we're just trying to help folks uh, who want to get involved in the industry kind of cut through uh, you know, these, these hundred page bills and just understand how they can get involved. Great, appreciate that. Great overview, Drake. And, and, and I recommend anybody who wants to get a crash course in everything that Drake just talked about. Uh, if, if you're a SIA member, uh, you can download it. It's, it's free for members. There's a cost associated with it. If you're not, but go to the website uh, and, and check it out. It, it's great information. So Tim, what does that mean for security practitioners? What does that mean for, for companies, for, for integrators, for security service providers? Like um, you experience with this, you're working in different states all over the place, dealing with this, you know, a, a dispensary or a, dis or, or a cultivation center in Illinois is not the same as Missouri, is not the same as California. You've done it everywhere. Kind of what are you seeing and how do the regulations either help hinder or you know, encouraged from the security side? Well, um, first, uh, you are absolutely correct that, that the uh, regulations are completely different in every state. Uh, no two, state, two states have the same regulations whatsoever. Uh, the, the guide, uh, the CS guide that they put out is, is an excellent uh, opportunity to, uh, you know, express that in a quick reference to see what it is in the particular state that you're curious about. Um, trying to keep them straight is the, uh, the most difficult thing working within multiple states. So I could not tell you today, right now, if you were to ask me in particular states that I've uh, recently worked in, I might know, but in some, uh, you know, if it were to go to plenty other states, I'd have to look it up myself because I've quit trying to keep up. Uh, it, not only are they all different as they come on board, but they change. Uh, Colorado, for instance, started out very loose. Uh, Oklahoma ha is still nothing. Uh, basically, uh, it, it is extremely um, light in the requirements. Um, but then uh, again, Colorado started out loose. Now they're tightening up. California did the same thing. They started out very loose. Now they're tightening up. Um, some states started out a lot tighter. And by that, um, not necessarily um, really major changes coming out, but uh, video retention, especially, is something that, you know, three years, um, a, a year, 90 days, 30 days, uh, the whole spectrum is there. And what is the right number? No one really knows. Um, but uh, when you combine the fact that, or when you, when you take a look at the, that you're looking at uh, retail, you're looking at agriculture, you're looking at, um, you know, several different types of markets and types of verticals that are all wound up into this industry. Um, you got to draw upon your past experiences and the best uh, best practices that you can find within those other industries and try and do the best you can, um, more so than what is just required by law. Um, try and do the, the right thing for security and, and get it right. You touched on something, and 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 uh, I want to. I didn't think we were going to go here, but I want to go there because uh, you, you brought something that's really phenomenal. Um, the the operational makeup of of the cannabis industry is unique because it, like you said, it puts together all of those different. It's almost like you know supply chain, manufacturing, retail, like office front, like like you know you're you're distributing out of a out of a uh, a storefront, and so you know there's there's not like a um one size fits all even in that value chain of the cannabis industry and and some some uh some states do it a little bit differently right where they distribute um and and this is a question tim so so correct me if i'm wrong they distribute licensing into those different areas and you may you may have all of them or you may only get a piece of them and so does that part of the regulation throw another wrinkle in where it's like, well, I only, I, I don't have a growers. I only have sale or dispensary is, is that, and that seems to be different across the board too. So is that, is that an accurate assumption? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, let's take Illinois, for instance, uh, their medical program, when it came out, they had two licenses. They had a cultivation license and they had a dispensary license. 
the cultivation license uh, allowed an organization to grow, to process, to harvest, process, uh, and uh, by processing, that is uh, converting it, uh, extracting uh, oil, um, in, infusing food, uh, making your gummies and your other edibles. And um, transportation was also part of the uh, cultivation because they, they transferred it all to the dispensaries for sale. The dispensary license, all they do is sell. Uh, it's kind of like a, a Walmart uh, or a Walgreens pharmacy. It has to be packaged, labeled, and ready to go, and that's what happens at the dispensary. When Illinois became recreational recently, they changed that, and they uh, separated the transportation license to a separate license. Uh, that is interesting, uh, and I, I'm, you know, I, I don't know why. Uh, it, it worked well the way it was, and they also, Illinois also requires uh, contract security to be used uh, so everybody that had proprietary uh, had to make some changes. Um, again, uh, it, it is confusing why they make some changes, uh, but it, trying to keep up with them is what what you got to do. That's interesting, and that and that um, you know you just took one state over a three year period and walked through some dramatic licensing and regulation changes that had true impacts on how you manage security for that industry, both from a service provider and an end user, right? If you like, all of a sudden there could be companies that do nothing but do transportation for cannabis. Like that's a niche now in Illinois and there's security requirements associated with that. Like that's, that's fascinating. Absolutely. But uh, Illinois complicates things even more um, with, with who regulates uh, the industry. Uh, the cultivation side is regulated by the Department of Agriculture and then uh, Illinois State Police on top of that. The dispensaries are regulated by the uh, Department of Professional Regulations and Finance uh, or Finance and Regulations, I'm sorry, um, and the Illinois State Police. So you have different sets of rules, too. Uh, they're not the same. Uh, the dispensaries, uh, the, the biggest difference would be the video requirement. Uh, yeah. the, they both require video to cover every square inch that is uh, allowable by law. So no restrooms, no, no locker rooms, uh, which makes sense. But uh, it, the retention, the video retention for a cultivation center is 90 days on site and an additional 90 days off site. For dispensaries, it's 90 days on site. And cultivation, it is also, uh, it can record at three frames a second on alarm, on motion. A dispensary is required to record 24-7 every time, even though the dispensary is closed, at uh, eight frames per second. Uh, it may be seven. I, I could be confusing that. But regardless, it is not three on motion. And you can't, and so everybody, and that, that was a change, that was a stipulation. It came out after the permits were issued and after plans were made, technical drawings or, or all of your uh, technology was bought and installed and they're ready for their final inspection and they come and inspect and a few permits were issued and then they decided to change it up to instead of recording on motion, make it make it uh, constant record and at eight frames a second or seven, whichever it may be. Yeah. Oh, don't know where this stuff comes from. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Like we could do a whole hour on just like the regulatory and the disconnect between you know actual applicable security requirements and why you go one way or the other. Like you know, why would you record nonstop twenty four seven in an unoccupied place and just waste time and money and value for that owner who has to pay for that storage costs money. And, and, uh, and, you know, that creates its own challenges. Um, so speaking of that, speaking of the, you know, that topic of um, the cost of the security technology, let's, let's go there and let's talk about the technology in place. Now, Drake, you mentioned this. Um, most of the regulations, if not all, stipulate three general um, technology types that have to be contemplated. Um, access control, video, intrusion detection, pretty standard three in our industry. Um, so from your perspective, when you're looking at that and, and you're you know, doing the research or, or what you've seen, um, is, it, is it like 
the, does the application of the technologies and the requirements, is that as inconsistent as some of these other things? Are there generalities that are consistent across the board or kind of what's your view uh, or sense of things as you've looked at this topic and, and, and specifically honing in on how the technology is applied? Right. So, yeah, what we've seen, I mean, kind of just picking up on what, what Tim was mentioning that, you know, in Illinois, they had kind of the cultivation facilities and then they had a dispensary. So a lot of, of states kind of, uh, kind of have three buckets. They have the growers, the manufacturers, and the dispensaries. So it's kind of like they're, they're bringing in those three as well as the transit uh, of, the, of the product to the manufacturers, to the dispensaries. And they're kind of looking at it. So if you're on a grower facility, you're outside, you have to have a fence that's a certain height that has certain cameras that can, that can watch certain corners to make sure that only authorized personnel are there. And you see that in most states, uh, the video surveillance requirements for these type of facilities. Now getting to the technology, I know that some cameras in some states have to be at least 1280, uh, 720p, whereas I believe in Michigan, it's, it's only 720p resolution. So some states have, you know, kind of those kind of uh, mechanisms to have lower quality cameras in certain areas. But uh, as Tim was saying, that they do have to all be functional and unobstructed and, and required universally in any areas where marijuana is handled. And on the access control front, you have some states that uh, they require facilities have two alarm systems, uh, just so that in case the power goes out, you have another you have another backup uh, uh, system so that in case uh, you know someone's trying to get in to avoid loss of prevention and to, to avoid loss uh, you know of this of this substance uh, that is is highly regulated in, in a lot of these states. So you're seeing some similar themes, but again, as as Tim was mentioning, uh, it is very patchworky, and I think it's because uh, it is still a nascent industry. I mean, the the first you know recreational. Uh, cannabis state was just Colorado in 2012, so it's only been about a decade. So I can see that that as you know the industry keeps growing and as states uh, start delivering more licenses for these facilities that people can kind of access, and as it grows and demand increases, uh, I think you might see something more similar to regular common security requirements across the board. But but again, that that that's uh, just speculating at the moment because. You know, usually these people who are uh, we're kind of regulating this don't tend to see it on the ground. They kind of have a bird's eye view, and they tend to be general in a lot of these um, regulations. Can I add to that? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go. Not just not just general, but they um, they they take concepts um, that they've seen, like on CSI, maybe even on yeah. um, you know that you need to be able to. Um, identify everyone um, from from video and uh, you know the cost of that and and the uh, the style of, of cameras and the placement would be uh, unbelievably expensive to be able to do uh, some of the things they, they they request for instance I had an Illinois State Police inspector in a cultivation center on a weekly inspection um, that uh, it, he thought you needed to be able to see and read on camera whatever the name badge was that was being worn the identification card we have to be able to read that by the, on the video ridiculous uh, i don't know anyone that can do that um the alarms uh, uh drake mentioned the alarms uh two two systems uh generally the second system would be on the on the vault uh secure storage area possibly even including the records uh, that need to be kept sometimes off-site with a third alarm system and all of these systems have to be installed in, in at least one state they require all of the systems to be installed by different alarm companies and monitored by different alarm companies so uh, it, it's treating it they're taking a concept from a jewelry store and doing the, the dual alarm and the dual company, um, which is highly secure, yet they're not telling you that this, the vault needs to be a vault and actually built to DEA regulations for a Schedule One vault. They're just allowing you to use secure storage. Um, video will not tape over things. Like said, that there are so, uh, and D1 on a resolution I've seen. Some of these, uh, 
rule people that are involved with uh, getting these rules written, I really, really wonder sometimes where this stuff comes from. I've never sat in on that, so I don't know. I'm sure a lot of it has to do with uh, somebody has to get their thing in there or they're not going to vote for it or whatever it may be. But some of these rules and regulations are really, uh, they don't make sense for security and um, others are just uh, cost prohibitive, really. That's a great point, Tim. And that's going to drive us into our in the, the best practices discussion that I want to go next. But there is an excellent point is that it, some of the um, work I know you've done and, and you and I have discussed previously, uh, the, the requirements just it, it may keep people out of the industry because or um, require I, I think a lot of just generally security isn't on the forethought of a lot of folks when they're putting a business together. And so I have to spend money to add uh, something to my operation, which is going to take away from my revenue. And I have to do it in such a way where I have to they have paid three different alarm companies. I can't, I can't get the, you know, magnitude of scale of, of going with, you know, three contracts with one, you know, and, and how, how does that make sense? And what other industries do that? You brought up, you know, jewelry. Um, and that's an interesting juxtaposition of like high value, easy to kind of steal and move. Uh, type of product, you know that that's that's a that's a connection I never made before. So that that's that's really interesting. Um, so so Tim, I'll follow up with 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 you on this around, you know, the in my opinion, the company should be whether it's cultivation, whether it's distribution, whether it's it's uh, a sale front, um, they should be building security into their operational needs and not just following the requirements. Um, you have personal experience in this. Let's talk a little bit about that, about you know how you're ticking and tying security technology and application and procedures and protocols to the actual operation needs and not just saying check, you know, using the regulations as a checklist and saying, yeah, I'm done. Uh, sure. Well, you know, access control there. I have never seen a requirement anywhere uh, in, in Drake. Please let me know if you have that. Uh, requires access control to be tied and integrated to alarms or video, either one. Um, why you wouldn't do that and utilize that operationally to reduce uh, the amount of hours of, of someone um, looking at, at entries and reports and this and that, why you wouldn't utilize uh, a, a, you know, a spot monitor with motion or some AI if you are going to use some analytics of some sort, why you wouldn't be able to reduce your uh, your cost on security? You know, uh, for instance, 169 cameras in a cultivation center. Uh, I, I had uh, six 57-inch uh, monitors on a video wall. Um, how many people do you think are monitoring that system in a cultivation center that's 72,250 square foot? I was the director of security. I had one person in there, and they could handle it. They could handle it because we utilize the technology together to operationally uh, manage our security program uh, in effectively and efficiently. We didn't need to have three people sitting and trying to watch all these cameras. And, and are, you, are all 169 up? No. And why would they be? But uh, an inspector wants to see all the cameras up, you know, but they don't have any any concept of operation. So trying to manage all that in, it, yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, it's important. Uh, and it's something that, um, uh, unfortunately, a, a vendor, an, an integrator, generally doesn't understand uh, how they can make it work um, for the company uh, to reduce the cost of security personnel, if nothing else, uh, as well as to make it more efficient and effective for the company. Uh, that's great. That's great insight. And, and I think, you know, some, some parting, you know, nuggets of, of wisdom. Um, if I can kind of synthesize what, what you're saying there is that you, you need some partners that know what they're talking about to get with you in the beginning as you're putting this together. And it's not something you're just going to throw in at the end because it's going to cost you 10 times as much in total cost of ownership and operating. And it's not going to be in the DNA of your operation. It's not going to help you be a better company and be more effective and efficient. Um, no, spot on. So Drake, in, in addition to that, you know, any, any thoughts you have, best practices you've seen as we're, as we're coming to a close here um, 
you know, or challenges or issues that you've seen or you've talked to folks that they run into um, that, that you want to um, touch on? Sure. I, I think one of the challenges, at least just, you know, from researching and reaching out to the other groups about this is, is the issue of states and having only a small amount of licensing that they actually distribute to uh, cultivation facilities, dispensaries. Uh, I mean, just the state of Washington, a good example, they don't actually have any more licenses to give out. So you kind of see that there's a backlog of people who want to get in the, in the industry, but they can't. Also, Vermont's another good state. They only have four licensed operational facilities in the entire state. Now, granted, it's a small place, but if you, you know, kind of want to expand the industry as a whole, you're going to kind of have to have more licenses uh, to dole out. And I think that's an issue that people are going to face, especially as more and more states, uh, you know, legalize recreational use, medicinal use, uh, and as demand uh, continues to go up, as we see across the nation. Uh, great point, Drake. Uh, excellent points, and and um, you know, it's just it's just interesting, right? Because it's like this this uh, infant, you know, thing that's growing and, and exponentially, and like and 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 what's so cool about it from my perspective is just how embedded security is with it, how important it is. There's not many other industries outside of like, um, you know, high security industries, you know, hence the name of our, of our uh, podcast here. And it's also not lost on us that it's 420, uh, that you know, security is required to be, to be participatory in this field. And, and so, you know, you have to embrace it. It's right there in the regulations. It has to be a part of it. It's also federally illegal. So there's this weird juxtaposition between our security industry, which is driven a lot by kind of formal federal employees and, and military. Like, you know, we got drug tested when I was in the army so that we made sure we didn't use this stuff. Now it's a whole different world 20 years later. So you know that whole thing is a whole other topic we could unpack and and uh, is interesting, but um, but that's the time we have for today, guys. Uh, Drake and Tim, thank you so much for participating in this conversation. Um, we could we could go on for you know I think another hour and dig into all these, and maybe in another place, another time, another venue, we can expand this conversation and go deeper. Um, uh, but real quick, I want to highlight um, this Security Matters episode was brought to you by. Uh, RISE, which is the Young Professionals and Emerging Leaders subcommittee within SIA. Um, go to our website uh, that was just flashed up on the screen. There it is again, um, the Accelerize event 2020. It's going to be a virtual event this year. Um, we just had our call for speakers. If you're interested in participating either as an attendee or as a speaker, take a look, sign up. We'd love to have you there. Uh, and uh, we're looking forward to it. So, so Tim and Drake, thanks again. Appreciate it. Um, loved having you on and appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you. you for having me. Happy 420. Yeah. <laughs>